So uh, I understand that uh, uh, our chairman, uh, Mr. René Le Tézieu, is online, and some board members as well. I'll see you, uh, Duran Prunisami is with us. Uh, my colleagues, MDs, GMs, CFO, uh, CCO as well, Chief Communications Officer, uh, staff of Medin, uh, my team at UH, uh, dear students from Middlesex University, I guess, uh, dear participants, as you know, we're having a hybrid mode. So some participants are uh, here in person and some others are attending remotely. And uh, so wish you all a very warm welcome. And thank you for sparing time on a Friday night or, or nearly evening uh, to be with us for the first talk of this uh, uh, monthly Unicity Education Hub lecture series. So please book your diary. Uh, we'll be having that every month. And uh, the, the question that has been put to me uh, by, by, by many people, or, uh, you know, each and every time I mention about the lecture series, they say, uh, why are you having a UEH lecture series? So uh, I say to them, well, we believe it contributes a lot uh, to building a vibrant learning and innovation ecosystem as we target not only the staff and the students of the group, but also of our partner universities. And, uh, uh, but we also have uh, 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 you know, the ambition of linking up with industry, industry professionals and the public at large. Huge job to be, uh, to be also linking up with the public. Well, why do we do that? Because we want to enhance experience, we want to share and generate new ideas, and we want also people to understand the power of ideas. I very much like this, uh, understanding the power of, of ideas. Uh, it's not from me, it's from uh, a Nobel laureate, chemistry Nobel laureate, 1986, John Blani. He's, uh, he's Canadian. And he used to say, I think he said that at his uh, Nobel lecture, and he said to foster innovation, you need a public that is conscious of the power and value of ideas. I think that, that's extremely important that we value and we understand the power of ideas. So for this first talk, we have the pleasure and honor to have with us Dr. Andres Mershin from MIT. Uh, Dr. Mershin earned his uh, MSI in physics and cosmology at Imperial College, London, and his PhD in physics and biophysics at Texas A&M University. He's currently a research scientist at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, where he leads the MIT label Free Research Group. Uh, I very much like uh, what he says, uh, that his group operates in blissful ignorance of any boundaries between physics, biology, materials, and information sciences. You do understand now uh, the relationship between bits and atoms, bits, computer parts, and atoms. Uh, so from inexpensive photosynthetic solar panels to quantum effects in molecular biology, and from cytoskeletal memory encoding machine olfaction to bioenergy harvesting, his research and the resulting technologies used by, uh, by industry and the government. Uh, mm -hmm. And during his recent visit to Mauritius about three weeks or one month ago, he mentioned to us that it's not just uh, in the US that his technologies are being used, but also in Africa. So, uh, so that's great. And very soon probably also in our country. His achievements have been uh, globally covered by, uh, you know, the big uh, TV, uh, by the big media, CNN, BBC, World, uh, Wall Street Journal, Discovery Channel, uh, you name them. And uh, uh, of course, uh, science, nature, uh, and also his uh, work are exhibited at the Science Boston Museum of Science and Designers Open Exhibition. Uh, Andres is also co-founder and president of the 
Oslo Cousin Public Benefit Foundation, co-founder of Biohab. You'll be telling us more about Biohab. Also co-founder of Sentience. I, I hope you touch upon that because that will uh, very much interest the public, uh, where, uh, which is about uh, developing an AI first olfaction platform for earlier and more accurate cancer diagnostics. Just, just to try to just mimic dogs. So right. uh, you'll tell us more about that. I hope so. Uh, so Andres, without any further ado, uh, the, the, the floor is, is now yours. And we look forward to, uh, uh, you know, you sharing your research findings with us. Thank you so very much, uh, Hanjay. And uh, I hope you can hear me, yes? All good? Yes. Okay, Excellent. Good. So uh, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to be here, the first speaker of the monthly series. I was very, very pleased to be invited to uh, to deliver this. I hope I do your Friday night um, justice. I hope you you uh, enjoy this. Please ask me questions uh, during or at the end. Uh, this is all about the um, interactivity. I have to to uh, echo Tanja and, 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 uh, and say that I agree very much with what he said about the importance of realizing both the power and the value of ideas in uh, any nation that wants to exist and to, to keep surviving, really, uh, this power of ideas must be recognized. And uh, MIT, we've done this pretty well. We are a community of about 10,000 people. About 3,000 of us make IP, intellectual property. And that IP every year generates about $2.2 trillion. Trillion. Uh, that is more than the entire economy of a country such as Russia. So uh, this is a one small little place that, that is ostensibly just academic. But what we do differently and what I want to show you here is that we have embraced this idea that if your name means nothing, then you can do anything. So we don't pay a lot of attention to the labels, which is why my uh, group is called Label Free Sci uh, Label Free Research Group. And today I'm going to show you about label free science and how it's done and how you're all already part of it. In fact, it 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 uh, is sort of engages a very uh, childlike part of the human mind to do science to begin with, and then to do it with joy and exuberance and without any boundaries. Like Danjay said, uh, that would be something very um, important to realize how it's done and that it's possible. We at the universities uh, often have emphasized the importance of focusing, of, of knowing everything about one thing, which is, of course, also part of it. However, that's not the end of it. Focusing is like exhaling, becoming very concentrated. Okay, But every now and then you have to inhale, too, and expand your horizons and look around. So when you have many things going on in your life, whether they not all have to be related to what your science is, uh, ideas cross fertilize and um, those ideas are useless if they stay in academia they must make it out into business into the field into uh, to, to have impact over humanity not just income for academics and papers for academics they, they must come out and must demonstrate their relevance to humanity to be um, to be of any use to be for you to feel good about even being an academic unless your stuff actually works out there what are you doing other than writing papers at each other so uh, with this, I want to uh, take you through a, post, a slide here that I, I use to terrify regular academics, because indeed there are no boundaries between the fields. Nature is all one. It doesn't say, oh, physics goes from here to here, then chemistry starts, then biology, then engineering. No, it's all one. So in um, at MIT, we, and especially at, at a place such as the Label Free Research Group, we expect everyone involved to be able to be conversant about matter at all scales, matter and energy at all scales, from the sub- uh, angstrom, that means nuclear physics, all the way to the astrophysics, all the way to kilometers and, and light years. And that is not such a big ask. It, we're not asking everybody to be an expert at everything, but we ask people to be conversant, intelligently conversant about all aspects of science with now no qualification. You need to know at least a little bit about everything in order to be able to synthesize ideas. Now, today, as Andre alluded to, we will talk about a project that uh, has to do with the zombification of ideas, how ideas never die. We used to have a project, I used to have a project when I first joined MIT 18 years ago, and decided I was going to use this opportunity to have impact on the world by creating the world's most effective and efficient biophotovoltaics. That means solar power out of grass clippings, out of agricultural waste. My mission was to impact Africa, uh, impact extreme poverty, and uh, I did this, I created this um, uh, method by which you can stabilize photosynthetic material, anything that used to be green and make photovoltaics out of it that were only 0.1% efficient, but still not, uh, compared to nothing, that was good. And yet uh, this won a bunch of awards, uh, you know, was published at um, good journals, et cetera, et cetera. 
And yet nobody in Africa was using it and still nobody's using it 18 years later, even though we thought we solved a good problem. However, solving this problem, stabilizing proteins on, to, on, on uh, semiconductors led to a solution to a different problem, which had to do with noses and how to make electronic noses using olfactory receptors from nature. The same stabilization technology was uh, used and now we have the world's first nose to have uh, beaten the dog at the limit of detection. And this nose is something else we're gonna talk about. Also note that in that same breath, in that same slide, we're going to talk about mushrooms that create food as well as biocomposite materials that can create buildings. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this, but I'm gonna mention that to see that the range is vast of this group, where we also accidentally created the world's first pain detector, first practical wearable pain detector using an EEG toy that was $300, uh, a toy basically, not a lab piece of lab equipment that we reprogrammed and then it became um, uh, a pain detector. We also created uh, technologies that harvest um, uh, energy directly out of trees without any batteries and allow trees to communicate when they're on fire. This here shows you a, uh, a, a very giant problem that is um, whole genome transplantation, how to take whole intact DNA um, uh, genomes and then plug them from one cell to another. We solved this for the Jake Craig Venture Institute with a device uh, that costs something like 25 cents. So a $100 million problem does not always require a $100 million solution. Sometimes a very simple thing is elegant and sufficient. So people often ask me, um, why, uh, wh what does my group specialize in? And we specialize in not, in not specializing. That's why we call the label free group. That means that we have spent a lot of time perfecting our ability to resist the instinct to write papers and keep doing the same thing over and over. Uh, once you master something in my group, the advice from me and others is, okay, now teach it to someone else and move on. Go learn the next new thing. Uh, this uh, approach has led to very fantastic results. This is a, a, physicist, a fluid dynamicist who took a office building and transformed it into a BL2 lab where he, what you can see here is a, the world's first 3D printer that can print lattices so precise that we can uh, control the fate of stem cells, including their differentiation rate, which is one of the uh, key obstacles to having stem cell therapies is the fact that the stem cells will not stay on the shelf long enough, they start differentiating. And if you're trying to, let's say, build a new liver, maybe they've already differentiated. And instead of a liver, you start growing teeth in there. So, you know, very uncomfortable for everyone involved. So uh, to keep them undifferentiated, you must control their environment. And this technology was shown to do this. This person was not a cell biologist, he was not a doctor. He was, didn't do anything about stem cells. He, he just learned on the fly. And this uh, was published in Nature uh, Microsystems and Nanoengineering and was also highlighted as the first uh, as, as top five best uh, breakthrough technologies of 2019 in December by The Economist magazine. Again, we're talking about impact outside the lab into the real world. And yet, of course, uh, uh, that was December 2019, then the pandemic hit. So this took a two year break, uh, but it's not coming back. I also want to make sure that you understand that young people are a giant resource. Um, I was, uh, 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 I was uh, introduced to some young people, including um, Nicholas here, who was an intern at NASA, and he said, hey, do you want to send some of your experiments to space? And I said, yeah, of course. But, you know, space is difficult, is that? No, they, they organized, young people in their early 20s organized a bunch of PIs such as myself, and we went and sent some stuff to space within nine months for almost no money. It was incredible what young people can do. I, I was very impressed to find out that the engineers who took humanity to the moon, their average age was 28. So uh, you being young people in the audience and uh, you being the managers and the, the esteemed um, uh, leaders uh, who are a little bit older, uh, we need to understand that young people are a resource. Their mind is inexperienced yet very powerful. They don't know what's impossible, which is why they keep doing it. So respect the fact that you're young and you, uh, if you are young currently, respect yourself, so make sure that you understand that just because you lack some experience, there's some people ahead of you that are older, uh, they have more experience, doesn't mean that you're less smart. In fact, you are the smartest you're probably ever gonna be. You can become more experienced, but your smarts are gonna start coming down. So try and make sure that you, you honor that. Use this period to invent, to be fearless and surround yourself with the people who um, uh, support you, who want you to go forward, who are not always critical, not always tell you, oh, you have to walk before you can run. Sometimes you can fly before you can walk. So uh, make sure you understand young people change the planet. Old people, not so much. <laughs> so let's uh, change gears a little bit and talk about smell. I want to talk about smell. First of all, a very interesting thing that perhaps you didn't know is that we all thought of this as being the nose, right? That's not the nose, that's the snout. 
this part here is not what you smell with. You smell with this part, which is in between your eyebrows and deeper in behind your sinuses. This is a piece of brain that actually extrudes through your skull through what's called a cribriform plate, which is a little frit with holes. Neurons come through and then uh, each neuron expresses only one of a, four, a palette of 404 olfactory receptors of which you have about 5 million copies total. And um, uh, many odorant molecules, that means single bits of uh, matter that are usually actually always, as far as we know, lower than 350 Dalton, which means 350 atomic weight, molecular weight, uh, which probably happens because they are all possibly, or at least all the big ones are a result of an amino acid being processed by the, by the body or by a flower or by something to create a, a compound that can fly around, be volatile and, and communicate the sense of scent. So you have this combinatorial thing going on. And this is how everything that we know about it, that there's um, a cascade. There's a lot of mystery about how exactly this recognition uh, happens and other things, but there's also a lot of nonsense about it. People, even though I will tell you about the significant, incredible, in fact, advantages of using dogs to diagnose disease, people often tell you that dogs are better at smell than humans. That's not necessarily so. There's many nuances to this statement. Uh, dogs are generally um, have a lot more receptors uh, types, about twice as many. And they have a lot more copies of them, about 60 million instead of two, two hour five or so. And then um, they also, their nose is closer to the ground, which is the most concentrated place for odorants. Uh, odorants, that means molecules that carry the sense of smell. They're usually uh, at least partially hydrophobic. They get to stick to surfaces. So the, all the smells are close to the surfaces. And the biggest surface that you have in your life is the ground. So uh, this is a trace of a dog who's wearing a collar with an infrared tracker of how they find this pheasant. It's a bird. So you can see that this is the pheasant's direct line, and then the dog sort of makes corrections as they go left and right. Yeah. You see, qualitatively, this is no different than if you take, I want to say, a Caltech student, not an MIT student, <laughs> and blindfold them and make them lo look for chocolate in the grass. You see, qualitatively, even the human, once blinded, actually can do this. And you should try it. I do this with my kids quite often. We play this game. I soak a bowl of perfume, put it in the, somewhere in the living room. And then if you trust yourself to not be uh, attacked by my other kids, you, you blind yourself. And then you, you start realizing that after a few seconds, uh, your nose wakes up and your brain starts paying attention to the nose and you start actually being able to navigate via your nose. Now, this looks silly, yeah? But it actually wakes up a whole part of your intelligence that you haven't been used to using. I highly advocate for you trying it. You will become smarter, even though you will look sillier. <laughs> so there's a lot of nonsense also about, uh, we have... Um, uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, famous um, headlines in uh, very uh, valid, supposedly journals that tell you in the same year, we had three headlines. Oh, the humans can smell, smell, not small, sorry, smell, 10,000 smells. That isn't all the textbooks. That's nonsense. Nobody's ever counted it. And it's not even something that admits a numerical answer. Somebody then publishes another thing saying, oh, no, no, it's only actually seven smells. Somebody else says, no, 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 it's one trillion. Okay, none of it is real. Because the, the, the question of how many smells can you learn to recognize is as silly as asking how many sights can you learn to recognize? How many poems can you learn to recognize? How many bits of music? No, it's the same. It's how much attention you put into it. Uh, the smell is no different than the sight or sound in its uh, perceptual engineering and how it gets encoded in your mind. So there's no need to expect that there's a limited number of them. And uh, the answer is definitely not accepts a numerical answer. It's, uh, it's, it's how much effort you put into it. So don't fool yourselves. That's something that Richard Feynman told us. Here we're fooling ourselves when we think that smell is fundamentally different than other sense, the smell, uh, other senses. Now, how does it work? Uh, this odorant molecule, which fluctuates somewhere in the in the wild, falls into your, gets inhaled into your nasal cavity, gets hydrated, it gets formed up, and then it gets sensed by these receptors, of which, as we said, as we discussed, you have 404 types. It gets it falls into the hydrophobic, gets sensed, and notice very importantly what happens here. First of all, everything's dancing around because this is at uh, 37 degrees Celsius. It's inside your head. It's a thermal noise. Nothing is frozen in place like they show you in the textbooks. So the dynamics of this process are important in order for the recognition to happen. The most important thing to realize is that the odorant molecule itself, as a result of being sensed, changes shape. And shape is part of what confers its odor character. So what that means is that you cannot smell something without changing it. It's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in olfaction. Olfaction is the fancy name, of course, for the sense of smell. So if you smell something, you've changed it. Same as if you look at something, you've changed it by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's also a very hopeful thing. It tells you that deep down, because of Heisenberg, because of Newton's third law that says for every action, there is an equal in magnitude and opposite 
indirection reaction that you can never really complain about the world acting on you in any way. <laughs> you cannot act on the world and the world cannot act on you. You can only interact with the world and everything you do gets done to you backwards and uh, in the same magnitude and opposite direction and vice versa. So it's a very hopeful thing. It means that you really do control everything and whatever is in your attention and in your perception is actually being manifested and, and controlled by you. And then of course you also are, are affected by all those around you because they're also observing the same world as you are. Very interesting philosophically deep thing you didn't know was going to happen in the nose lecture. <laughs> okay, so also important that you can train many different animals uh, to detect smell, including incredible feats such as, such as uh, training Drosophila fruit flies to detect deuterated odorants. Uh, that was so important that we published in PNAS on the same day was highlighted in both science and nature. And what this means to you practically as a society, what we need to realize is that as we're walking around to a trained nose, whether it's a dog's nose or a technological nose, you're leaving behind a trail of information. That information is very useful to anyone who's interested in finding out about your mental and physical health states, okay? You're constantly doing this. Now, of course, this here is an artist's impression. It's not real, but ahead of you, as you walk, you know, there's a big giant plume that is not visible here that has to do with your breath. As you expel your breath, you're communicating everything that's going on in real time, by the way. It's even more powerful to the right sensor than genetics because this uh, actually tells you what your body's doing right now. Now, to this end, we have um, uh, done a lot of work. And in fact, this lady here, Dr. Claire Guest, she is the uh, co-founder and um, uh, CEO and uh, chief science officer, rather, not CEO, maybe both, I'm not sure, of Medical Detection Dogs UK, a fantastic charity supported by the late Queen of England and other royals. And um, what that charity does is it does both science, showing how dogs can be trained to detect various diseases from Parkinson's disease, various cancers, uh, epileptic shock, diabetic oncoming shock, and many others. Uh, and also uh, creates dogs that uh, can be used by humans directly. So here's a dog that was trained to diagnose disease. You can find that, that the, the sample that has the, the, the person's um, signal, I don't even have to tell you, you'll figure out the dog is very cool at communicating it to me. Okay. <laughs> I didn't have to show you which, which one is the dog trying to point your attention to. Okay. So, um, and very good here, they're actually using the dog's uh, um, body language to tell. And this is how the dog is pushing on the correct sample. So this is a GCMS, that means the analytical um, results of what happens in the urine of these people who have prostate cancer or other conditions. And the question becomes, what is the correct question? This here analytically will tell you a list of molecules that you can find biomarkers and that could be a signal. However, we found that the dog does not know this list. It does not know any chemistry. It does not, and when you sniff something, you're not getting a list of molecules by name and number. You are getting an integrated sensation. You're getting something which has a beginning, middle, and an end, and it's a perception. It's not a list of molecules. So to that end, I asked the following question. And this happened to me many years ago. As I've been building these noses, I have been learning about them. So this is my daughter. Uh, she's holding my son who was newborn. She's holding him up front. So he's not, he wasn't really that huge. It's just a perspective error. But in any case, I was changing his diaper and she walks in and says, uh, what's that smell, daddy? Now, my instinct was to point to the diaper, point to the poop and say, look, here it is. Here's indoles, cattle. These are volatiles. They communicate the presence of bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a, a moment of, uh, of calm there. And I said, uh, instead of ask, answering all that science stuff, I asked her back. I said, oh, what does that smell tell you? What's that smell, daddy? What does it tell you? I don't want to eat it. Ah, so if you ask back, instead of what is the smell, what does it tell you? Because it's a communication strategy. You get a very deep answer from a two and a half year old. So the smell of poop tells you, you don't want to eat that. The reason is of course, that if you do, you will get sick because it's full of bacteria. And that's why we're all born with an aversion towards the uh, scattle and indole, which are the byproducts of bacterial activity. Those are the telltale communications of, uh, of the fecal smell, the poop smell. So a better question than what is that smell is what does it tell you? What does it tell you to do? And does it tell the same thing to everyone? It tells me to run away and not eat it, but to a fly, a house fly, it's actually a very fertile ground for her to go put her eggs in. So for, to a fly, that same aversive smell would be attractive. Okay, so very important uh, adage here by Richard Feynman, uh, a dead uh, a physicist who died, uh, uh, but uh, he also got the Nobel Prize. And he, the day he died, he left this on his wall, on his uh, blackboard. What I cannot create, I do not understand. 
So we flipped it in my group and we call it build it to understand it. And so we built the nose to understand how the nose works by create, creating this device, uh, by putting human olfactory receptors also from rats and, and mice onto a field effect transistor with a source and a drain and some nanotubes in between. We assembled it up and uh, we showed that this can actually detect, uh, the limit of detection of this device is 200 times lower than the dog's limit of detection, which means it's 200 times more sensitive. But don't get too excited because it's also 100 times or 100% uh, stupider than the dog. It doesn't understand anything. All it does is it detects something versus nothing. You have to train it for every molecule. It doesn't have any of it, the dog's intelligence. Also, it's very large. So for that end, we've been shrinking it and making it sure that it can eventually fit in your phone and it can be trained. And these are some uh, uh, results. Okay. So this is what's happened with the, the, the dog-inspired technologies. There is one dog that has been shown, uh, one of two that we trained to detect prostate cancer. And this became a paper, which then became a patent, which uh, or several patents by, by many different people, which then, of course, um, uh, the paper itself and the interest in this uh, has led to a, a startup. Now, remember how we said that uh, you're a smart audience, so I'm not afraid of you changing gear. This was all about noses, and now we're going to talk about mushrooms, and we have some time still to talk about mushrooms and how this impacts Mauritius. Uh, so before I continue, any any questions so far? Maybe I just go on. Hanja, you can, uh, okay. You can also raise your hand or interrupt, that's fine. So um, remember, we were talking about this part here. We're making noses, this is a nose. This uh, ability to stabilize olfactory receptors came from our understanding of how to use um, agricultural waste to create solar panels. The project that I alluded to in the beginning that didn't go anywhere. Well, here now we have a project that actually went someplace and then some. So this is a zombification of ideas. The, the power and value of ideas is to um, uh, is so vast that they don't even easily die. You have to, uh, uh, when uh, uh, an idea doesn't go somewhere, it, it kind of uh, freezes itself and then it reappears later on it's like somewhat different guys. The main idea that you'll see here is that we uh, are interested in taking something that is waste or trash and treating it essentially as treasure. So there, somebody's trash is our treasure. And um, so it all happened with a bank uh, represented by Carolyn Kirksmith, uh, the South Africa's largest, uh, or actually Africa's largest bank called SBG, Standard Banking Group, uh, came to take my class that is called Lab to Market the MIT Way that I teach at Sloan Business School. And um, then she came to my office and saw this mushroom and said, uh, what is this? And then that question led to the rest of it, which uh, led to our, us having an experimental outpost station that creates food and materials. And now I'm going to play you a, uh, let me see here. I want to play you a short three minute video, which explains all this better than I could in 30 minutes in only three minutes. So let's see if you can see this. You should be able to see and hear this. Namibia. So this is what happened since the bank sponsorship of um, MIT work. Namibia. Oh, that's not good. I'll let it buffer for a bit. If not, we, I can give you this um, oops, this link here to in your chat, so you can watch it on your own. I can move on from that right now. Oh, it seems to have to be loaded. Okay. Namibia. A beautiful arid country in the southwest of Africa is experiencing record drought, homelessness, and unemployment exacerbated by malnutrition in COVID-19. Standard Bank Group has teamed with MIT Center for Bits and Atoms and Red House Studio to develop a new way of building designed to create food security agricultural jobs, and dignified low-cost housing all at once. The project is called Biohab, and it's the world's first building made with this sustainable technology. Biohab is not just a building, it is an ecosystem. We start with the blackthorn encroacher bush that is choking the country's water supply. By harvesting the bush, we enable grasslands to regrow that can feed cattle and antelope. We've shown the biomass from the bush is excellent substrate for growing gourmet mushrooms, a food that uses the least amount of water, land, and energy per pound protein of any. Mushrooms provide food and generate income for the farmers. The waste from the mushroom cultivation can be used to create building materials. By pressing and baking the waste, 
The materials can be made stronger than concrete. The construction of the biohab works like this. An inflatable arch formwork is erected. The bricks from the agricultural waste are stacked on top. Once the bricks are in place for the arch, the formwork is deflated and can be used again and again. A mud lime rendering is added to protect the bricks from the elements, and a roof is added on top. With proper waterproofing and topsoil, the roof can be used as arable land. Standard Bank, the CBA, and Red House are committed to furthering this technology to reach millions of people with healthy food, good jobs, and comfortable, dignified shelter. And in doing so, hope to inspire the building industry to look at sustainable, low-carbon materials for building and regenerative practices for growing food. In the world after COVID-19, Biohab is not just a building, it's an ecosystem. An economy. A community. The future. Okay, so that was that. And uh, now I would like to go back to presenting. Okay, I hope that was, so this was uh, in fact something that we did build. Uh, it is out in Namibia. There's seven containers in which we are growing these mushrooms. Okay, I do not know what that is. So, uh, and, um, okay. And uh, here's what they look like inside. These are bags. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity here to improve. To all the people in the audience, whether you're senior uh, scientists uh, or businessmen or young students or anywhere in between, we need so many improvements here. We need to replace these plastic bags with something. We're now working on uh, using um, boiled, uh, various, uh, you know, people are, are thinking about using boiled um, uh, fish scales or other biodegradable materials. I was very impressed in Mauritius. You had the plastic bottles that claimed to be completely biodegradable. We need new solutions to this. But you see how this container requires no, a lot, not a lot of land. It makes dozens of kilograms of edible mushrooms per week. We're selling them for $11 a kilogram, sorry, $11 a pound. All of our, all the money, 100% of it, all the revenue, not just the profits, the revenue goes to a nonprofit called Buy a Brick, which buys regular bricks for uh, shack dwellers. And this is the beginning of something. Uh, the largest company that uses mycelium, which is the root system of mushrooms currently, uh, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And they have seen the light, as I, uh, I, I admonish you to see the light, that this is the moment of pivot for humanity. This is sort of like when plastics became a thing. And we realized there's one central process and one central material called the um, uh, petrochemicals, uh, called, called oil, petroleum, that can be used to create everything from objects such as furniture and car fittings and, and, uh, and computers uh, and toys. Everything you see around you mostly uh, that isn't wood or metal is plastic. And the rest of it is concrete. So this replaces concrete, plastic, wood, and uh, maybe some metal. Now, it does not require a lot of land, it does not require a lot of water, it does not require a lot of electricity, and it's very fast. And uh, uh, pound for pound, the food that you get out of these mushrooms, if dehydrated, the mushrooms are pound for pound, the same nutritional content and protein content as beef. And they only take 21 days to grow instead of beef that takes months and years. Uh, upon completion of the growth cycle, which takes 21 days each time, you compress the waste and you create bricks. You don't eat sorry, you don't build with food. Food is holy, we must eat it. That's why don't fall for the nonsense that we have here in the United States where we grow corn to make ethanol to, to put into cars. That's silly. If you're growing corn, eat the corn. Don't, don't, don't use the food for something, anything other than feeding yourself. Food is holy. But the remnants of food production, don't burn them. Don't put that carbon back in the atmosphere. Use it something for it to, to create good for it, with this. So the trash of the mushroom production becomes bricks the bricks store the carbon. This is a carbon negative process. And bricks are not the only form factor. You can use other form factors. You can make 
furniture, uh, door fittings, etc. And notice how this idea of trash becoming treasure didn't die. This was back 18 years ago, whenever it is that we published this a long time ago, 2012, not 18, not quite 18 years, 10, uh, 10 years ago, this was published. But even before that, for 18 years, uh, since 2004, we've been working on this, became very famous. We created these um, uh, bio photovoltaics, and to this day, the most uh, efficient on the planet. And um, out of everything green, we tried everything that we could find, including seaweed, and because the idea was powerful, we saw so much agricultural waste being waste. And we thought, well, can you use all this waste that people pay you to take off their land for something good? And uh, now the idea has zombified and come back to, to life. And it has become this. We do harvest acacia millifera, which is an encroacher bush, uh, thus saving the farmers from having to burn it and then do other things with it. In fact, they can pay us to take this off their land. Normal businesses take a raw material, add some value to it, and sell it for more money. This business starts by already being paid to remove the raw material from somebody's land. And I think in Mauritius, you have this fantastic opportunity, especially with Medine, especially with um, sugarcane production, the bagasse that, you, that is left behind can be used to grow mushrooms. In fact, Mauritius already has shown us that they have a, a mushroom growing uh, expertise. They have uh, really good academics uh, that are involved in this. And they have the land, they have the 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 the, the withal, they have the market. In fact, in fact, Mauritius is importing mushrooms now, so you can sell mushrooms to your own population as well as export it. Mushrooms are one of the fastest food. Uh, the, the demand for them is one of the fastest uh, growing food sources. The demand for, for which is growing so fast. Also, there's medicinal mushrooms, and uh, people can make teas and other things with them. So the demand is great. So the process is you inoculate these mushrooms. Uh, sorry, you inoculate this waste with a spawn which is a mycelium root system. You make sure that everything uh, that isn't your, your uh, uh, species is killed off by pasteurization. Then we put it in these molds, bake, uh, compress them and bake them. That, uh, I'll show it to you in, in, in a minute. The important thing to remember is that in doing so, what you're recovering is not only food that you can sell for more money than beefy, but more money than, than meat this food goes for when fresh. You're storing this carbon for the duration of the, of the building. You cannot count the stored carbon that, of the food that you ate because you poop it out and goes back in the atmosphere. But however, you can count as carbon negative the brick. The brick that stays in the building, the building can live for 25, 125 years, you know, sometimes even longer. Uh, these bricks are very strong. And for that, uh, there's an equation that comes from this that shows uh, uh, something quite remarkable, that for every one, 10 kilograms of brick, that we create. We also kill, uh, create 10 kilograms of edible mushrooms, thus feeding the population and nutritious, delicious food with zero pesticides, zero chemicals. The only thing that go in there are the clean substrate, which means the encroacher bush, water, heat, pressure. That's it. No chemicals, no pesticides, no herbicides, nothing. Uh, no fertilizers. In fact, when you destroy these buildings, and you put them back in the soil, the soils become maximally fertile because the mycelium encroached brick, this thing here, is actually uh, a fertilizer. So um, now it's very important to not just show you success. I want to show you models and role models of success, but I also want you to show you our failures. We first, uh, when we first proposed this, we proposed this as a self-reproducing building. And I was very gung-ho to do this, where we had an inflatable structure that was uh, going to actually inflate with this. Here's a banker, Carolyn. She is a multi, a pluripotent individual, same as many of you. That means that she's not a one-trick pony. She can do more than one thing. Here she is welding together using a 30 uh, plus thousand dollar uh, master uh, weld master machine this is then called welding together the inflatables that were uh, actually designed by Can us in the, sure and here you can see uh, a 300 and uh, no 223 dollar solution to a thirty thousand dollar problem we have a sharpie that could be can be programmed to run around this using the pulleys on the full end of it that's creating any shape so this is a bit too loud that's creating any shape. The closest we could get to that in Namibia was the, the ne best next idea to, to create the shapes that we needed to create the inflatables was a $30,000 plotter that would come with um, engineers and, and expensive ink and maintenance. And this is a $2 Sharpie on a $300 or $223 machine. And we, we've opened this up. Anybody can melt, make this apparatus now. This is what, what happened with the inflatable. What happened is we it worked for a little bit, and then uh, the rats attacked it. They ate holes in it. We kept trying to fix it. We kept patching it up. It was a great idea that we we tried so hard, and until the end, we could not make it work. 
So it's important to show you failure too. Don't expect that everything that in science works in, uh, all the way. In fact, 90% uh, of what we do is failure. And, and if you are succeeding more than 90%, more than 10% of the time, then I would think of you as actually being very suspect. Either you're not challenging yourself enough, you're, you're taking too small of a risk, uh, or you're lying. <laughs> so a 90% failure rate is not acceptable, it's expected at MIT. That's what, how you know you're doing great stuff. So uh, I wanted to show you something that the Wall Street Journal did. And this is a... Uh, also be more resistant yeah. than concrete, a withstanding impact, like from this sledgehammer. So this It's started, not the most scientific of it tests, is not. but it... Okay, so this was just to show you a little dramatic test that we did. Sometimes it's important to give the, the people something they can, you know, remember, because it's one thing to show you a bunch of graphs from where we did all the scientific tests, and another thing to show you that our bricks are more resilient to impact than um, the... Concrete bricks. Of course, in real life, that's not what they're for. They're, they're, we have to demonstrate that they can withstand compression, shear forces, and other things, which we do also in the lab. So the, the concrete, sorry, the inflatable failed. Uh, so we had to replace it with, unfortunately, regular metal scaffolding. Then we first built our first roof like this. It collapsed as expected, and now it stands. It's like this. This is as of uh, two days ago. This I uh, got the picture from Namibia. Uh, here's how the operation works. This is the worst part of it, uh, which takes so long. These are the bags that the mushrooms have been harvested from. And our um, uh, our partner here, Saki, Mr. Saki, he is putting everything in there by hand. And uh, I don't know if you can see that he's using this, this uh, wood piece of wood. It looks very primitive and we need to do better than this. Uh, so we also have this walk-in oven where these giant molds, which are about 25 kilograms without the 10 kilogram uh, substrate in them uh, are, uh, are put in overnight to kill everything and to compress to, to make sure that the mycelium stops living. So we built another failure here. We built this uh, hand pumped uh, brick extraction device that on paper at MIT looked perfect. Then I went there and saw what they had to deal with trying to get the bricks out. And I realized this is unsustainable. Look at what we had to do. I mean, this was just nonsense. Look at this over and over again by hand and uh, that's me doing manual labor not my favorite and um, this uh, allowed us to take three bricks out every 90 minutes this was of course unsustainable so being MIT this was on a Thursday and we decided that and Monday was a holiday so by Tuesday we had built this so this now this now applies uh, over 200 tons to take the brick out in less than one minute. So we, we went from three bricks for 90 minutes, the 30 minutes per brick, to one uh, brick per minute. And this is a very proud moment <laughs> this year, getting the brick out of the mold. So these are the kind of things that you don't expect that uh, it really helps to be in the field to, to actually understand. Um, and these are the various technologies, and I'm about to, almost over. These are the various technologies that uh, can make money using this. Mauritius is perfectly located for this. You have the resource, you have the waste, and you're located in the Indian Ocean uh, as a gateway to Africa and also as a cross, uh, uh, as a refueling point and a cross point for, for many, many uh, interesting trades and ideas to be cross-pollinated. You are in, in a perfect position to take uh, hold of this, to work with this, to improve on the science of it, such as, for instance, modifying the genetics of these mushrooms to directly, and I'm always advocating for academia that is directly connected to industry. This is no good to, to stay in the lab forever. This is already making um, money. So uh, you can see all the various things from bricks and blocks to boards, to leather and fittings, to <laughs> people are making now underwear out of uh, mycelium, you, uh, leather replacement. This thing here is very interesting. We just recently found out that when we squeeze our bricks, uh, the water that comes out is impregnated with all the mycelium remnants. And apparently, if you soak biochar in it, uh, that soaked biochar, soaked in mycelium tea, goes for 300,000 American dollars per ton. So we've thrown away so much of this. We didn't even know it was valuable. So we still start just now learning. Another important thing is this. Look at this triangle. We call it the micro triangle. On the, on the top part here, you're making food, drink, and medicine. Those are lucrative businesses already, and there's much science to be made. While you're doing this, this, the byproducts of doing this are actually creating bricks, composites, packaging, and insulation. In fact, McDonald's has now committed to over the next two years or so to replace their clam shell uh, Big Mac containers, of which there are billions of them are sold in the, on the planet every year, 
um, uh, and they're made out of styrofoam, which is a carcinogenic substance, really bad for the environment, they're going to replace it with mycelium technologies. So, uh, and while you're doing all this, you're also creating intellectual property, okay, but also payment for good system service, services and carbon credits. So this being an MIT project coupled with Africa's largest bank, what connects us is both MIT and SBG are maximally dependent on our reputation. We cannot be um, uh, lax with our facts, okay? Our facts drive us, we're scientists. If, we, if we're found to be you know, less than um, uh, honest uh, and direct and transparent, then we lose our reputation, then heads will possibly literally roll. <laughs> so uh, maybe not literally, but um, so this allows us to actually claim that we're going to create the world's most transparent, most believable, most legit carbon credit, because right now, it's a very scammy market. A lot of people tell you things like, oh, I would have burned all this stuff. Now it didn't now give me money for not doing something. That's not how we want to do it. We have a, a blockchain back transparent process where every time you buy these mushrooms, you can tell where they came from, how much diesel was used and how much carbon was put out in the atmosphere, harvesting the substrate, how much carbon was sucked out of the atmosphere, making the, the bricks. Uh, so you can have a real uh, honest uh, uh, account of this so that people can believe it. So th that triangle makes money on all three axes, on all three points, all three ap apexes or, or corners as a result of the other two. And it's a very interesting technology that, that allows you to do this very similar to what Plastics did because at the center of it, it's the same process. It's the same fungus in the middle of it. And then the, the, you know, your imagination can roam wild as to what you want to make with these new materials that are coming online. To finish up, this is my last slide. I would like to invite your questions. They're very valuable. If you think of them now, ask them now, you put them in the chat or email me later anytime, uh, email me here. Uh, you can also submit your questions anonymously here. I will read them. I don't have to answer them. You don't have to give me your email, but I, I do like questions. So I uh, do, do submit them. And I actually have the first question here. It says uh, the sugar cane fields in Mauritius are heavily treated with fertilizer and pesticides. So the bagasse that is produced most likely contains large amounts of residues of these agrochemicals. How can we be sure that the bricks can be made from this don't contain these chemicals? Yes, very good question. Or that the mushrooms produced using bagasse don't contain these agrochemicals. Fantastic question. Whoever asked it, uh, very good. So let me explain the answer to this. There is uh, two answers. One, you do not know upfront how bad the contamination may be. So you must check. Well, before you sell anything to for human consumption, you must do the analysis and check that you don't, you're not selling something with, let's say, lead in it. We had the same problem. Uh, we found that when we harvest bush next to the highway, uh, in Namibia at least, there's an, enough trucks and other things that are putting out enough lead so that you can actually contaminate those bushes. So we cannot take that because even though we did not find lead in our mushrooms, uh, we still don't want to be anywhere near lead. Lead is a, is a bad thing. Now, so you check. If it comes out that your bagasse uh, is so contaminated that it actually makes it into the fruiting bodies, which is a big question mark, not necessarily so, then you cannot sell those fruiting bodies. You must uh, be happy with just containing it inside of a brick, making furniture, making bricks, making buildings. Now, those chemicals that might be captured inside of a brick, so long as they're staying in there, so long as they're not off-gassing and getting into your body, you're okay with it. Currently, you all live in buildings that are, uh, their insulation is made out of fiberglass or um, uh, there's plenty of styrofoam components now in America, plenty of chemicals, but so long as they're inside the walls, you're okay. Uh, of course, if you now destroy that building and put it back on the ground, all those chemicals will leach back into the ground. So that's something to be considered. Now, also re remember this, many, many uh, cases exist of some species of mushroom, not all, that are capable of detoxifying their fruiting bodies, including from very toxic things, such as actually ionizing radiation. There's, they're, they're called radiotrophic mushrooms, and they exist in places such as Chernobyl or Fukushima, where they actually photosynthesize and thrive by absorbing ionizing radiation. And their fruiting bodies, as far as we know, are not radioactive themselves. Also uh, true with micro-remediation, which means remediation of uh, contaminated waters and soils, when you allow the mycelium system to run through it, the mycelium becomes toxic. It absorbs the chemicals, but the fruiting bodies oftentimes do not. It is a case-by-case -case determination, and you must check very carefully before you put anything in the food uh, in the food supply of humans or animals, really. So, um, but it, it is hopeful. They're, they're just like in many, you know, uh, an apple tree, for instance, uh, can can live on on really contaminated soil, and yet the apples are clean. 
Uh, garlic, for instance, gets uh, grown routinely in sewage water, and yet you eat it and you, you can't smell the sewage and there's no contamination because there are these uh, mechanisms by which the progeny of an organism is actually kept clean. It's not 100% and it's not in all cases, so you have to check, otherwise you can really get in trouble. I hope that answers that question. Yes? More questions, please? Here, I can go back to being uh, on the video. I can't hear anyone though. Hanja, you, you're, you're muted again. Yeah, uh, I think we have a second question on the chat. In the meantime, people get ready for one question from the audience. Yeah, I don't uh, see the chat. I think we have, uh, just one second. Uh, no, I thought I thought it was a second question, but I, I, uh, in fact, it was just one question, and the other one was your uh, was your uh, YouTube. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, feel free to ask any question that you would like. To yeah, please. Ask. Questions are important, and don't worry if you're afraid of a question. That means that other people are afraid too, so they will silently thank you for asking it for them. Here, I'm going to uh, put the Wall Street link here also. Any question, maybe, please. Maybe, uh, maybe one for me in the meantime. Uh, right. You mentioned that uh, uh, the structures failed until uh, yesterday or a few days ago. Mm. Uh, and uh, what maybe that you could get, you know, something uh, that was that stayed uh, stable? Right. So the structure keeps failing. It's not that it was failed until yesterday. We keep making it and um, pushing it and allowing the wind to attack it to see what it will take to fall. Uh, we are actually also, this is just something that we're doing for ourselves to understand it a little bit better because we're trying to put up this roof as an exhibition. Uh, and then um, we also have professionals who will take about eight months and $130,000 in South Africa where they're building a model of our home, of our, of our building with our bricks that we're sending them. And then they're going to shake it, uh, burn it, and do all sorts of other nasty things to it. And then our bricks and process will get certified. So currently we're not certified to build anything in, in any country on the planet, uh, but processes like ours have been certified in America. So it's not like there's fundamentally something weird or, or uh, dangerous about building with these materials. It is that it's new and people do not like to expose themselves to the risk of trying something new. We couldn't find a single um, a, a civil engineer that would take these and stack them as we wanted them. We wanted them to be stacked and held together by gravity only. So that is part of the reason they keep falling. We didn't have any mortar inside uh, in between them, no glue. Uh, we were very ambitious. We thought we, we did some math, we did some calculations and we thought there would be enough gravity holding them down that because of the shape is an inverted catenary. So if you put a, a chain between a metal chain, heavy chain between two points, the shape it takes is actually a mathematically perfect shape that if you invert it, that shape is uh, the shape of, um, of an arch that stays up by itself. You do not need, the components uh, will stay up by their own gravity. This was known to antiquity. To this day, you find uh, ancient structures from uh, uh, two, 3,000 BC where they have that same shape. So that arch is very well known to architects since antiquity. We wanted to follow the very well-known architects from antiquity. It turns out our, our bricks, I think it's because they were so light. They're about um, uh, half the density of uh, water, okay? Instead of five times or whatever it is, uh, the density of the, let's see, what is the actual number? Um, yeah, so our, uh, uh, yeah. So the density of concrete, including the air pockets is 2.1 uh, grams per centimeter uh, cubed and we are 0.64 grams per centimeter cubed. So I think that was uh, that was the reason why with high wind, the, the pressure on the uh, on each brick was not enough, so it fell over. But we keep trying to make it fall over. So what made it actually stand up now is the fact that we put, I don't know if you noticed, we put those sheets. Let me show you again um, here. If you notice, we put those sheets under it that seem to have stabilized it. But it's in a, you see these, these are wood. We do not want them to be, uh, and we put some uh, mortar also. But uh, it's, I think it's this plane here. Now, we really did not want to use the scaffolds. The reason is metal scaffolding is heavy. It requires expert personnel to put together. It is dangerous. If, if one of these falls, the whole thing collapses. If one of these falls on your head, you can die. The inflatable, on the other hand, I actually had it fall on my head and nothing happened. This thing here, the whole thing fell on my head. 
uh, flipped over this part. Nothing. No problem. You can hold it up like this. Even though it's heavy, the weight is so distributed. It's mostly holding itself up. It's like a bouncy castle. Very safe. Also, you kept you keep reusing the, the, the you know you put it you deflate it move it over reinflate it very quick, unlike the traditional scaffolding. So we're going to go back to trying inflatables. It's just that uh, this first time we were entirely too ambitious, and remember this was originally designed for Mars, Mars colonization, and there's no way no way you're going to bring metal scaffolding to Mars. Okay, no way. So you have gases, you have inflatables, those kind of things you can bring. You cannot bring anything like that. So uh, we are inspired by the by our failures. We share our failures. We learn from our failures, and that way they become successes. Okay. All right. So from Nelson, what factors would you attribute to MIT's capacity to create a conducive environment for innovation and to be at the cutting edge of technology? I think almost all of it is uh, attitude, Nelson. It is not money. Money comes because of this attitude. It's not equipment. Equipment comes because of this attitude. And the attitude is that of respect of the process itself, the process of innovation, the process of discovery, the process of exploration, the process of invention. Just stay out of the way of people who are inventing, you know? <laughs> don't waste inspiration. Don't, uh, don't um, pay too much attention to authority and top-down knowledge. Go find for yourself. That's attitude. The attitude of going and taking it on and uh, being honest, uh, being curious, being creative, and being fearless, that's the attitude. You all should copy it and you should all compete with MIT. That's the way forward. I keep telling people that it's nothing special about MIT. It's not the geography of it. It's just historical. And we happened to be near Harvard and that's why we became so big. See, Harvard had the opposite mentality. Harvard, you had to know someone, you had to be royalty or, or connected or very rich or something to go to Harvard. And if you knew someone, even if your grades weren't good or if you didn't know what you were talking about, they would still take you. MIT doesn't do any of this. The MIT has no legacy admissions. No, if your parents came here, it doesn't mean you get to go here. <laughs> it's really about the people about who want to do things. So if you want to do things, MIT is the place to where we won't stand in your way. And uh, it's not really uh, about the geography or the money. You can replicate it outside of MIT. Mauritius has every right to expect that they, they can be able to do, the, to do this. Unicity is a great platform to start thinking this way. Forget about the boundaries. Forget about authority. Just go and do it. Learn. Most of the information that you need to go forward is online nowadays. Of course, you start online. You don't finish it. You know, you don't trust Wikipedia 100%, but you start at Wikipedia. Uh, university is evolving. The role of university is no longer to be the place where you go because that's where the knowledge is. You go there to interact with interesting people, such as professors and other students, and you go there because of the equipment that you cannot have at home. The knowledge itself is available online. It used to be the university used to be where the library was. Remember, this whole idea came out of how churches and monasteries were organized. Uh, so it's transcending now. We're, we're, we're changing the role of the university. And at MIT, we've understood this. We understood that our role is to foster uh, the creativity, honesty, um, and adventures, and adventure, intellectually adventurous spirit of the people who, who come here. And it's attitude. It's not geography. It's not money. The money and the rest of it comes from this attitude. Okay, from Diren, the CEO. Can you elaborate a bit more on the medical advances which could be made possible by artificially recreating dog smell? How far away are we from this technology becoming mainstream? Thank you for that question. I love that. So I will share one more website that you guys should go into. And it's this here. Uh, so I am the co-founder and president currently of the Osmocosm Foundation. Osmocosm uh, it was, is, a, uh, is a nonprofit uh, that is sponsored by these people. And we just concluded our annual uh, conference where we had uh, our keynote speaker was somebody whose intellectual properties in every single one of our bodies. Bob Langer co-invented and co-discovered the mRNA vaccine and the mRNA technologies. He's also the co-founder of, of uh, Moderna. Uh, he has over 1500 papers, 1400 patents, uh, a recent billionaire, and also our top professor at MIT. And the nicest person you've ever met. He gave us our keynote lecture. So the medical applications of dog-inspired techno dog technologies are vast. We have, for instance, um, uh, here, the, uh, my co-founder, I'm sorry, I'm looking for him now. And uh, where is he going? And uh, uh, there he is, for, of Sentient. So Sentient is a, the first company that was directly inspired to create the solution that we have dogs delivering, which is uh, sniffing for prostate cancer instead of biopsy. You just give one ml of urine to a dog that has been trained and they have over 99% precision. So 
the dogs are not practical. We don't want to have dogs in hospitals. So we created this company called Sentient. You, you can uh, open, I think there's a website, yes. <laughs> and this came because of this foundation and because of, of the work that I did. But uh, so this uh, company currently advertises 95% accuracy, but it's actually going to go higher because um, the more you train a dog, the better it gets. And this um, artificial dog intelligence that Sentient has created behaves similarly. The more data it sees, the better it gets. So we're hoping to get above 99% and even beat the dog uh, at our limit of recognition. So this community of people is looking at very many different uh, applications. Uh, Adam Feldman is a co-founder of, uh, of Sentient. He's an actual practicing uh, uh, surgeon, urologist, who sees this as a potential um, replacement for biopsies. I want to sort of uh, scare a little bit the men in the audience that once you hit 50 years old, uh, they're going to ask you to do a PSA test, which uh, is a blood test. And if the PSA is elevated, they ask you to do a biopsy, which is a large needle up the bum, through the gut, bites your prostate. And uh, this is a pretty medieval procedure, uh, completely unnecessary in my view, because the body's already communicating everything that's wrong with you uh, through the millions of pores that you have. The body's literally leaking biologically relevant, diagnostically relevant information day in, day out. You, you're leaking that information in your urine, in all of your emissions, even just from your sweat. So uh, for us to be making holes for diagnostic purposes is wrong. We do not, we're not very good at making holes in the human body. We always mess it up. And uh, our rallying cry for this company is no more holes. The human body has the right number of holes. Don't go digging in my body unless you have to take something out. Like if there's a bullet in me, fine, make a hole, take the bullet out. But if you're just trying to diagnose me, why are you digging in my guts? Why are you making holes that can kill me, that can give me sepsomia, et cetera? So the medical diagnostics are, are poised. They're not there yet. It's all in startup mode. But uh, we're thinking in a few years. I have three more years till I hit 50. I, I'm not going for this needle. I want to be diagnosed by a sniffer technology versus a needle technology. I think we should all demand this. The, it does exist in labs. Now it's time to, for it to, to come out of labs and become part of our, our healthcare mainstream. Yeah. I hope that answers Diren's uh, question. But again, I think that uh, uh, people such as your students uh, can contribute to even this work. Uh, there's a lot to be done, a lot to be understood about smell. And that's why we bring many people. It's not just, see, these are doctors of rhinology. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a chemist, uh, uh, animal behaviorist. This is an expert in uh, uh, sensing environments. This is an expert in fluid interfaces and how to interface with humans and uh, all these sensing uh, geneticists, geneticists, bio artists, and many others who contribute to this year. And every single one of these lectures is now available uh, online. You can see them. And I wanna say, I'm sorry if uh, it should be on YouTube. Let's see, uh, I, I believe, if I, might, I might be lying about this. Oh yes, oh, and there's my kids. <laughs> so yes, if you can go to Osmo Cosm, you can see all these lectures uh, that answer many of these questions. Uh, they are available for free. To everyone forever yeah yep uh, yeah yes yes uh andres we have a question from uh, nelson yes nelson is uh, from rwanda and uh, from uh, coventry university there so he's asking a question about what factors would you attribute to mighty's capacity to create a conducive environment for innovation and to be at the cutting edge of technology yeah, I think I answered that. That was the attitude. But the one I didn't answer, I saw the Nelson, I, I didn't answer, but Martin. Martin asks, yeah. will the certifications you will get after all these tests can be validated by British standards? An example, our construction ecosystem here applies the standard. Are you applying for a sort of universal standard? Uh, Martin, I wish there was a universal standard. We, we used to think, well, going in three years ago, I used to think that because uh, this technology has passed the American standard and because the American standard is supposedly the most strict on the planet, that this was automatically going to be inherited by other countries. But it turns out every country wants its own standards to be proven to them. Possibly this might be a bit overdoing it, the risk assessment, uh, but I can understand why they're doing it this way. And it's not only just that you have to do it for each country, it's that you have to do it for each instance of the process. So we have one outpost in Namibia that is creating these um, bricks and we can certify that outpost. Then we can sell the bricks in Namibia. We can sell the bricks in South Africa because those two have an agreement. We might be able to sell them to a couple of other countries, but then if you build another plant, just like ours in let's say Mauritius, that same, that, that new plant has to be recertified every single time. There's no 
way legally around it that I know of. So uh, uh, that is a barrier to entry that is significant. It's about $130,000 and no less than eight months worth of testing. And every time you build a new plant, you have to redo it. At the same time, it's a little bit of, a, of an okay thing because you can be justified that if you raise enough money to build a plant like this in uh, Mauritius, let's say, that somebody cannot just quickly go and make another one and copy your idea and, and, and take all your money. So you have some protection against people easily copying it because it's very easy to do, right? Mushrooms are very easy to grow. They, they're basically hard to stop from growing. <laughs> they really want to grow. Yeah. I think we have a last, uh, uh, this one is already answered. Uh, I think uh, we went to all the questions. Uh, anything else from the crowd here? No, uh, Andres, uh, Sebastian is asking what is the price of uh, the of the brick that you produce compared to a normal one? Oh my God. So these are currently, I mean, how to price them, right? We don't sell them. We give them uh, for testing. Uh, we sell the mushrooms and we donate every single penny. Uh, so we sell the mushrooms for, for $11 a, a pound, which is $22 a kilogram, uh, roughly. So how to price the bricks? Well, if you want to be the least favorable to this technology, then you should take the number of millions that has gone into researching this. So it's probably about two, two and a half and divide by the number of bricks which is like a thousand. <laughs> so in that case, this will be the most expensive bricks mankind has ever made. <laughs> but that's of course not the way to do it, right? So even when these become um, produced en masse, then in fact, they have almost negative cost because for every brick you make, you've already sold mushrooms. Like for every 10, 10 kilograms of brick, you've sold, sold 10 kilograms of mushroom. So you can give the brick away for free. It's like cherry on the cake, right? Uh, but if you concentrate on just looking at the bricks as the outcome of all this, then forget it. They're, they're, they're the most expensive bricks on the planet. But if you focus this as, as being the beginning of a new technology where some of the byproducts such as bricks happen to be very useful, but also free, then it's a different perspective. So I'm not ready to tell you how much you can buy my bricks for. I'll give you one for free. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But the fact that they are valued, but does it mean they have a limited lifetime? Yeah, so the lifetime issue is very important. We feel that, uh, first of all, there's no uh, way of accelerating time in the lab. You can do some things such as, you know, flame and other things and, and, and various temperature fluctuations to see how they will behave in the wild. But in the end, it's just lumber. You have to treat it the same way that you would treat any, uh, any wood. That if, if you build a, a surface that, that's facing the outside, facing the elements, wood requires treatment. It requires a coat of paint or some membrane something to protect it from constant rain. We don't think that these materials are invincible. I think eventually they, you, know, you will find that they, they will attract bugs, just like everything else. Even though the fungus itself has consumed most of the what is consumable there, there's still going to be something that wants to eat it. So you, you'd probably have to treat the outside to not allow pests to come through, not allow water damage, uh, just impact, dust, etc. So if the question was, uh, will they age better than regular bricks? Uh, we feel that from the measurements we can do, they're stronger than regular bricks. They can be made stronger. They can be made much, much stronger. It really depends on how far you push them. So starting with the same exact material, if you don't push far at all, then you create something frothy and soft and lightweight, which is a uh, perfect insulation and perfect, uh, actually really, really good fire suppression. Also, they, they don't burn these things. They like to suppress their own flames. Uh, if you keep compressing it, it becomes stronger and stronger until it reaches the, the, the strength of concrete, and then it keeps going. It can actually become even more stronger than concrete. Uh, now, does that translate into better aging parameters? Maybe, maybe not. We're not sure. It's just like wood, in different woods age differently. Uh, you know, different treatments of the wood make it age differently. So this is to be found out. But it's no, the, the you know, with all the science we can put forth. Uh, we can't see a way that this is worse than, than lumber. This is better than lumber. So that's how we're starting. But we won't know until we know. Before we take this this last question uh, on how far was the local community engaged in getting these new products part of part of their routines, uh, what, what are the challenges of, uh, uh, you know, of those bricks for now? Is it about getting uh, their compression strength 
uh, much bigger or is it about yeah. uh, more no. complexity or uh, densification? What, what are the challenges? So the biggest challenge we have is actually rate of production. So we calculate about 2,600 bricks necessary to make a 37 square meter home, which is what we've designed. And we've been at it now for maybe four or five months making bricks, and we still haven't made enough. So we are still experiencing teething problems. Our press keeps breaking. Our, the most annoying part is that um, we have the materials and sometimes they're just sitting there, you know? The, the, and um, the, the slowest part of it, and if someone can help us innovate around that, is that press. So you, you saw our worker shoving in things. This here, this here part is the, the, the worst part of it. All is this here, let me show it again. Uh, share screen here. This part here is the slowest and worst part that we do. And I am very uh, uh, sort of in the process of thinking through how to do this without investing a giant amount. Look at him. He has to open up every bag, right? He has to open up every bag. He has to weigh every bag. And he has counted them. Now he knows how many bags he needs. Now he's going to show them into this. And this is all to make one brick. So 11 bags or sometimes more go into making one brick because th this mat mass here has to be compressed. The water has to be extruded, et cetera. So this part here is my least favorite part about the whole process. If you can help us figure out a better, faster way of doing this without spending a ton of money on, on creating a giant industrial sized press. I was thinking something with conveyor belt, something that automates this process a little bit, something that doesn't uh, have him uh, peel these bags all the time. It's just, you see how, how horrible it is. And this is our biggest problem. It's the rate at which we can create these. Even if this uh, person or other people were doing this 24 seven, and even if I have a second press, it would still be too slow. You see this? And, and then he has to show them in. <laughs> it, it's just dispiriting. Now we built all of this. It's our fault that it's this slow. <laughs> I'm not blaming anyone. It's just that's the best we can think of, but it's too slow. I mean, obviously there are many solutions that can be had, especially after you scale it up. Our purpose here was to show that it can be done, but for this to become a properly, um, uh, you know, lucrative operation on the brick side, very difficult. It's already properly lucrative on the mushroom side, but this this press is not going to cut it. Let's see. Uh, have you have you checked with the with, with the guys doing some uh, you know well versed with uh, extrusion and so on? Right, so we did try doing it ourselves. We did try extrusion. That we had this uh, big giant um, um, arm to extrude. It does work, but then you don't get the good bricks. If you want to make it extrudable, this material, where you have to make it sort of jellified, then it becomes more like um, um, like leather almost. You know, it does not solidify again in in a in a brick like thing. For other applications, including. <laughs> Here, there's uh, somewhere here you can get, um, let's see, uh, Stella. So Stella McCartney is a, um, uh, a, a clothes designer and she makes things like this, which out of mycelium. And this is extruded mycelium uh, where you do not, you, you, you grow it on, uh, yeah, here's a here's a how you do it. You grow it on. Um, you don't let it get all the way to the dry form. You grow it into this form, and then you you. Uh, I guess are you sharing right. anything? Because we can't see anything. Oh, are I'm you sorry. Sharing? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. How am I not sharing? Um, let's stop to here. I'm sorry. Okay, this here. Can you see? This is Stella McCartney's uh, fashion line, and she makes underwear. This is. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. So she makes, uh, this is a, a world-class designer and she makes fashion using mushroom mycelium. And this is the extruded part. Somebody asked if we can extrude it. It becomes like this, it becomes very flexible. You won't make, make a brick out of it, but it's the same process. You can start with the same process and end up with something like this, with the mushrooms or end up with a brick or, and she calls it Milo. And there's an actual proper market for, for clothing now, uh, in, including, I've never actually tried this uh, on my skin. I do not know what it feels like, but I have tried the jackets that they make and um, uh, there, it still needs to be perfected. It's a bit, uh, it feels a little bit like touching, like touching a mushroom, actually. It's like, it's a, it's a little slimy, a little bit. So not the best thing for direct to skin contact, but uh, it's getting better. People are, are doing better extrusion and better everything. 
Now here it says also how far has the local community engaged in getting these uh, products part of their routines? Not a lot, I have to say. We've been in Namibia for on the ground operating for about a year and a half. We only started making bricks a few months ago. We've been selling mushrooms for about six or seven months now. And uh, the mushroom production has flown off the shelves. We cannot keep the shelves stocked. As soon as we give it to the supermarket, within 20 minutes, they're gone. And even though Namibia is a very poor country, we're selling them at an extremely high price, $11 a pound. It's crazy. Uh, but people buying them, people flying off the shelves when they're fresh. We also have a massive overproduction of dry mushrooms, which we're saving now. We're going to sell them in Asia or something like this. Um, but the community itself, uh, so we had to convince them on two things. First of all, we didn't. We thought we were going to have a problem convincing them to eat mushrooms in Namibia, but end up being no problem. People love them. Just no, the taste is perfect. They, they love cooking with them. They love new recipes. So that was not a problem. What was a bit of a problem that we didn't expect was they did not like the concept of our roof being um, not, not like this, not a triangle. They said, oh, why is it a viral shaped roof? Why is it an arch? And I had to explain that the physics of it and that it was designed for Mars and we had an inflatable and this and that. And like, no, 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 you people in America and in, in the West, you live in triangular shaped houses. Why do you want us to live in this viral shaped house like a hobbit? <laughs> and I kept saying, look, I want to live in there. <laughs> I really want to live in one of those. Uh, no, no, no. And I had to explain that, look, there's a practical aspect to it. And that it's not like some, there's a lot of mistrust and a lot of, uh, why are you trying to get us to do something that you're not willing to do in America? And I keep trying to tell them that the reason it's not happening in America is because there is a several trillion dollar a year established construction industry here that when we reached out to them, and they are, by the way, the number one polluter uh, and carbon emitter on the planet, uh, and especially military construction. You don't think of the military as constructing things. You think of them as destroying things. But in fact, they're the number one constructor of cement-based structures on the planet also, especially the American military. So in any case, they're polluting the environment like you wouldn't believe. And then when you give them an alternative like this, they get really, really threatened. They do not like this. They, they see this as a threat an existential threat to their business model. So this is not going to happen in America. This is going to happen somewhere where there's no established uh, construction material industry that is being threatened. So that's why we went to Namibia. There's no brick makers there that are going to feel the uh, the the need to freak out about this, you know. And um, and I think it's a technology that will be developed outside of America in places such as Namibia, perhaps such as Mauritius, and then be reimported back to America uh, for the great benefit of whoever started it first. So I can see Mauritius making a ton of money uh, exporting these materials back to America. I uh, think that's the future. Uh, when, when you when you talk about the cost of, uh, of the mushrooms being eleven dollars per pound, this is what you say, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how do you compare the costs with uh, the 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 traditional cultivation of the mushrooms? Is it is it look? Is oh, it lower? we're making so much. Yeah, we're making so much money. This this is a shocking number to us. Eleven dollars a pound sounds and is a lot of money. Uh, this more than meat. Uh, pork here in America goes for two dollars and ninety nine cents a pound. Pork that you have to, to to raise and feed and then wait for months and years to grow. Pork, a whole pig. Uh, yeah, but, but 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 why should people buy uh, those mushrooms, which which uh, which, as you say, is at a higher cost? Than uh, you know the the mushrooms that you will you would cultivate in a in a in a very traditional manner. There's no real difference. The, the I mean oh, okay. uh, the, the, the the you can't really tell the difference if you the difference in the quality of the mushroom comes from size and freshness and of course the species. If you compare our um, um, uh, our oyster mushrooms with others that are found in the supermarket. If you say, if you take them from the same day of the harvest and they're the same size, I don't think you can taste the difference. Uh, our method might be, we haven't compared actually uh, side by side whether our costs in growing these mushrooms are lower. But what we do know is that we make the triangle. We have everything else going on for it. We make the materials, we make the carbon credits. We are saving the environment from the encroacher bush. We have a research station. So our, our methodology is not really about making money, although now the time has come to actually make it make money also. It is making money. Now, the question is, how on earth are the Namibians supporting this? Well, we're obviously addressing only a very small segment of society that can afford these kind of prices, right? So we, we weren't there to feed the masses with mushrooms. We're there to show that an, a, a process like this can work and it can work on all three axes. 
And now we're finding to our delight that we can create these mushrooms for the market. Okay, the very top uh, earners. Uh, and they, they buy it straight off, you know, flies off the shelves in 20 minutes. And, and it's considered a gourmet food. Obviously, the, that does not scale to the billions of tons of mushrooms per year, right? You're going to saturate the Namibian market before you do anything. So exports are important. Similar to Mauritius, you guys are actually importing mushrooms to the tune of several million dollars a year because you're already your internal market is not saturated by your internal production. So you can uh, feed yourselves more mushrooms that you're already eating by importing them. And you, I think you can also export mushrooms very easily. Uh, if the question was uh, whether, you know, how does the pricing of the production compare? Uh, we have not compared it to a, a, a commercial mushroom growing operation where all they care about is making mushrooms. But we know that they are, we are selling them at about the same cost, uh, about the same price point as they are. Now, who's making more profit? We actually have never compared. We don't care. We, we, we give all of our profit away anyway. We give all of our revenue away. Now, it doesn't have to be like this for you. You can make a for-profit operation, but we as MIT and the bank, our remit is um, research, philanthropy, and showing that business models can work and then decoupling, letting the business people make the money. Okay, uh, I think uh, we've reached, uh, we reached the end uh, of uh, this first talk. Uh, let me thank you uh, on behalf of uh, the group. Let me thank you for uh, thank you, you know, sharing your time uh, you, you've been with us for more than one and a half hours, and uh, thank you a lot. It's been a fantastic talk, and uh, I think that will. Uh, you you mentioned so many times during your talk ideas and ideas and ideas, and this is exactly what we were looking for. We're, we're looking for new ideas, and I think that there are many so many new ideas coming. Uh, this is not our last encounter. Uh, there's more to come with uh, MIT. And yes. uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming the first student uh, here in our group. So uh, that would be great. And uh, thanks again. You'll be remembered for having delivered the first talk. Of thank the you so much. Series. My honor. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we thank you all. And uh, thank you all for, for your presence with us. And uh, I see uh, the MD Agriculture here. Uh, I'm sure he's uh, got a lot of ideas uh, to, to, to share. So um, with these words, uh, thanks to all also to all participants who've been online. And uh, with these words, let me uh, close this session and uh, let's uh, continue the discussion over email and uh, hopefully see you uh, here next year. I understand that you should be uh, visiting Namibia very soon. So yeah. look forward to uh, welcoming you and wish us back again. Yes, thank you so much, Hanjay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, class and Hiran uh, and, and Medin for the invite of the fantastic uh, opportunity. And uh, I hope to hear from you. Write me, I'm easy to reach. And uh, let's bring this to Mauritius and the world. <laughs>